Our next speaker is Tony Parisi. And Tony has been in this space for a good while now. So uh, Tony was a co-inventor of VRML. OK, Henrik, thank you. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm having a really, oh, right, we got mic issues here, too. Here we go. I'll stay here. I'm having a really interesting uh, latter part of this week. Last night, I was uh, doing a startup incubator talk for some uh, companies I'm advising, and it was at uh, uh, downtown San Francisco at 181 Fremont Street. Brian, is that address sound familiar to you? Yeah, I had a startup there in uh, 1995 uh, doing my first VRML company, and here I am this morning uh, talking about this stuff with you all. Uh, so as Henrik said, uh, I've been at this for a while, a decade and a half doing uh, web-based 3D development, and uh, Henrik asked me to share a little bit of that perspective uh, by way of uh, saying, hey, I'm excited about WebGL probably as excited as a lot of people in the room. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe we can just share a little perspective, get a little background on this, and uh, see if we can uh, maybe learn a few things from the past. Uh, so when I did this before, we actually had quite a bit of uh, hype and energy around it. Uh, I'd say probably in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars invested in companies, and a lot of bombast, and, and a lot of stuff that ultimately uh, did not go as far as we all would have liked. And, uh, there, there could be a lot of good reasons for that. Most of them actually aren't technical, uh, if you uh, look at it deeply enough. Um, they have a lot more to do with timing and business, so I'd like to talk a few, through a few of those with you folks. <clears throat> so uh, let's take a look at a little, uh, little timeline here, a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, I think it's worth just uh, quickly reviewing this stuff and then putting it behind us. So it was 1993. I moved to San Francisco and this uh, guy I knew from uh, New England came and found me and said, I have this great idea. I want to put 3D in a web browser. I said, like Snow Crash, like Neuromancer, you know, I'd been reading these books. There had already been work done in this area or talked about this vision had been existing for decades already. Doug Egelbart, Ted Nelson, this goes way back. Projects like uh, the Habitat Project, Chip and Randy. Um, so this is not, wasn't a new idea then either. but. Mark brought me a PC, I think it was a 486, that had real-time software rendering on it where you could play a little chess game. And he said, we've got to put this on the web. And so we said, OK, let's try it. We started building a prototype. And then about six months later, uh, Dave Raggett, then at HP, I believe, uh, put out an RFP uh, for the first web developer conference saying, hey, we're looking for recommendations, suggestions for how to do virtual reality interface on the web. And Mark showed up at that conference in Geneva and said, we built it. We hadn't really built it. I mean, I'll tell you about the prototype in a second. But we kind of had the, the beginning idea of what we wanted to do. Um, that ultimately turned into a lot of noise and a mailing list and a lot of wonderful activity for about a year. Um, and then Mark and I, this is the interesting part of this week, is Mark and I came down to a building that was probably within half a mile of here and met folks at Silicon Graphics and started talking about this. And they said, hey, you know what? We've got this great file format, this great technology for doing content. Maybe we can adapt that and get it onto the web. And that became VRML. And the first spec was written in 1995. Uh, and there was a lot of sort of hype and uh, uh, interest in it. Press, a lot of articles. This is the future of virtual reality on the web. People wearing head mounts, all these funny uh, mm -hmm. pictures showing up. Uh, and remember, there was no Twitter. I mean, we're talking about tech press. Things were still printed. You know, you could touch it, right? Um, and the reality was a little bit different from that. The actual thing, the first thing that Mark and I built, was a banana that spun around in a web page, and when you clicked on it, it had a hyperlink. It wasn't exactly a video game. In fact, it was nothing like a video game. You couldn't do anything more than that, but we thought that proved the concept. Well, you know, the reality was a little bit farther away from that. Um, despite that, by 1995, 1996, uh, Netscape, Microsoft, people getting really interested in this stuff, and a whole industry formed around it. Around it. Startups got it funded. It was pretty cool. It was a pretty fun time for about three or four years. Uh, in, uh, into a second version of VRML, which we call VRML 97, which had actually a lot of capability in it. By then it was animated, real interactive behaviors. Um, you can actually script in JavaScript, which had just basically come out at that point, by the way. Uh, you could build applications in Java, and it worked in the then you know, standard market standard web browsers. Pretty exciting. Well, that was the technology side of it, but still building a business around that, very interesting in that time. Um, it didn't really work out. I mean, basically, at some point, the hype and the reality were so far apart that those companies either got sold off or shut down. 
Uh, VRML was largely forgotten about uh, for a while, really couldn't get arrested in the States. No one wanted to talk about it. Um, people licked their wounds. They came back and started working on another version of that called X3D, which came out around the 2004. Uh, by then, essentially, people had moved on. The whole world had changed around us, uh, but we were still sort of plugging away at this effort to get 3D in a web browser. Um, you know, now, a lot of what I'm saying sounds a little bit negative, but there were kind of cool things going on in little pockets of the industry and in other places besides the United States where we have a very different way of looking at you know, how you build a business and very different time frames. Uh, Europe, for example, VRML had become something of an interchange uh, standard, at least in practice. It was you know, what you could get out of some tools and bring into other tools and, and all that. So you know, it wasn't exactly dead. It was just sort of a lost interest period for a while. The other thing that was uh, kind of going on at that time is the video game industry got together and said, we need to solve some problems like this, did not want to solve them with the technology that X3D had sort of gone down this path on. And the Collada format emerged around, you know, in the 2004 to 2008 timeframe. Uh, and it's become essentially the de, the de facto and, you know, actually de jure blessed standard by the Cronus Group uh, to interchange graphics data among tools and to, uh, really in intermediate format to really export out of tools and bring them into other systems. So even the standards world started bifurcating, which uh, didn't really help developers understand what was going on uh, in a sort of large sense, but you know, actually created a viable uh, platform for people to export content. So that was all very interesting too. Um, so while this is all going on, of course, what happens? But people are distracted with real stuff. They're trying to figure out the web. They're trying to figure out web 2.0. So it wasn't ever time for 3D on the web. So here we are now, years later, 17 years later, and uh, we're seeing something in WebGL that could be it, finally. I'm very excited about it. So before we move on to you know, what I specifically think about WebGL, I want to just take a quick look back at where I think we went wrong. So the five ways to screw up a great idea, at least in this case. Uh, first one, for sure, is you know, we were pretty immature about all this. We're talking 1994, web browsers barely worked, there wasn't any Java yet, and people were showing, if not the spinning banana, something barely more interesting than that, uh, running at five frames a second, right? So that didn't really work out. Uh, content, people didn't know how to even author this content yet. There's a vision for, you know, uh, virtual reality and working, you know, walking around in these big virtual worlds or, you know, high-end visualization stuff, but to actually achieve that and create that kind of content was super expensive back then, like it's not now, you can use cheaper free tools. Um, so, you know, we really didn't hit the mark on the content. Technology was definitely shaky. Uh, the messaging was all over the place, as in, you know, for some people, it was all about building a virtual world, virtual world always was. For others, it was about CAD. And we never really sort of reconciled that, so people were getting messages all over the place. And again, I've mentioned this, it was so hyped up, there was no way we were gonna meet the expectation. So that was all sort of, of a piece of it being early. Um, we had a lot of compatibility problems. The implementations did not work well together. We, we ultimately, as an industry, banded together into a consortium uh, headed by uh, Neil Trevitt for several years, a fellow over there in the side of the room. Hi, Neil. And um, we actually worked hard on interoperability ultimately, but damage was done by then, so people could not build content that would run the same in different browsers. There were a lot of pri proprietary extensions, just fragmenting development and developers didn't even know where to look. So that was a big problem. We also had uh, some infighting going on during all these periods of working with VRML and X3D in terms of people advocating competing standards, mixing the messages about what the technology can do again, and in some cases, big vendors sowing fear, uncertainty, and doubt about this stuff to try and get you to use their implementation. They shall remain nameless. There was a big accessibility problem, tools you could afford, uh, you know, IDEs that you could actually build with, and it was just basically a big mess on the product side, and really only for the crafty practitioners, the wizards. So, you know, big issue there. We tried, but no one could come up with a business model at that point to give away a free tool, and it, it just never sort of worked. It was it was too early, really, pre-web, and early web. And and finally, that's the the main point here is timing is everything. Uh, not only were we early, but both times uh, during VRML's time and then when we tried to recast as X3D, uh, we were violating this, this essentially this market principle, which is when there's a big wave of discontinuous innovation going on out there in an industry, uh, such as the internet, and people are obsessed with it, such as figuring out how to program Java, or you know, in Web 2.0, how to do photo sharing, 
uh, trying to launch technologies like that when there's another big party going on next door does not work. And so there's always something else going on, right? So with those in mind, um, and just kind of putting those chapters behind us, the question becomes, where are we now? We're all excited about WebGL. Um, are, are some of these things going to happen again? Are we going to repeat the same mistakes? I sure hope not. That would be a tragedy. Um, and what could we do to avoid them? I mean, that I want to leave for open discussion, but you know, I wanted to at least uh, uh, apply a little bit of analysis to it today and give you my thoughts on where we might be with this. So what I did was I actually measured WebGL on the uh, patented periciometer, which it's, it's a very delicate instrument. It's very, uh, actually a very precision instrument, and I'll uh, show you how you operate it. So you take this device right here, this measuring device, right? And uh, I'm going to have to come over here. And you point it at the subject, and you scan your data, and then you take a step back and direct your gaze while retaining this image directly to your navel, <laughs> and you contemplate. You ask your gut, and then you record your data. And so I've done that and applied that to WebGL, and here's what we've come up with. So on, on the immaturity uh, measurement, I would say we're in pretty good shape. Uh, it's, it's still early. We've got the first implementations out, but this is really solid stuff made by really solid companies built into your browsers. That is fantastic. Um, on the content side, I think we're still seeing a lot of experimentation. We haven't seen uh, the killer apps come out yet. Um, so that's where I think we're you know, still running a little bit of risk, but I'm very excited about that with the, uh, you know, the ability to develop so cheaply now and it being worldwide and shared, you know, the likelihood that we're not going to have killer apps come out of this in the next few years, very low in my opinion. On the compatibility side, um, the, the, the vendors, the manufacturers seem to be working very well together. The Kronos group is doing a great job of shepherding the standard, answering the market questions, uh, dealing with all the shader issues, all the other stuff that's out there. So I think very low risk there. Uh, potential infighting thing, we don't have browser support in Internet Explorer yet. That would be really nice to see soon. I'm hoping Microsoft will get on it and do it. I think they will. I think it's just a matter of seeing killer apps out there, maybe the developers asking them, hey, when's it going to be ready? And in fact, if you're a developer, I would say start asking them about this because they, they listen to developers. They don't listen to people like me, you know, gas baggers. So, uh, you know, definitely talk to them. Uh, there is also Unity out there. They're, they're exporting WebGL stuff somehow, so that's great. They say they want to support it, but it's a different engine that can potentially fragment development. There's the Flash Molehill stuff. So, you know, there's still a little bit of a, a potential tech war thing, and I think there may be a danger there, but I, I'm pretty hopeful on that front. Uh, on the inaccessibility thing, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword. That's why I marked this one in red. This is the outlier for me. Um, having to write shaders, kind of a pain. Uh, the fact that there's no kind of standardized file format I find ironic and kind of coming full circle from where I started on this when we started with a file format and didn't have any programmability. Um, I know there's stuff emerging with 3JS and libraries like that, CNGL, GLGE, um, and JSON formats for that. But still, that part's a little under-evolved, and I, I, I just fear that this is going to be in the realm of priestcraft and real wizardry unless we can get some simpler tools there. So I'm particularly concerned about this one. Maybe this is market opportunity for folks who want to make middleware, SDKs, uh, that kind of thing. So I'd like to see more of that. Um, timing, I don't believe timing's a big issue right now. I, I, think, I think this is where we're going. I'm trying in my mind to imagine some uh, new Web 3.0 thing that's going to somehow be in the way or, or the people, consumer's not ready for this, or the device is not being powerful enough. But all those factors seem finally to be lining up that, and, and making it such that this is the time when uh, 3D on the web is, is just an idea whose time has come. So, you know, overall, I give it uh, 0.2 vermils on the Parisi scale. So in pretty good shape, I think, and I'm extremely hopeful about it. And uh, just want to end with uh, a quote from Victor Hugo, no army can stop an idea whose time has come. So I really do think this is it. I'm excited to see all the energy in the room. Would love to talk to many of you and, uh, you know, uh, exchange ideas and and talk about what you're worried about, and uh, you'll see me blogging about this stuff. I don't have a, a company or anything. I'm not doing any business in this area. I'm just really passionate about it and excited about it and would love to share that with all of you. Thanks, Henry. Excellent. So um, Ken has the mic. There's a question over there. 
Wow, we made it through. You got a hole through. It's very exciting. So let's get a question. Hi, I'm Scott from SRI, and I'd like to get your thoughts on the graphic card block listing that's happening in the different browsers, because this technology is totally dependent on which browser implements it and you know how they do their part. The uh, I have a relatively recent laptop that's been performing very well with this graphics card, and yet I'm continually having to force enable in the different browsers. So uh, how do you think that's going to affect the market, their impression of all this? We have a mic. I'll use this one right. Okay. Um, it's it's an issue. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm less concerned about that than a lot of these, but if... If I could deflect and defer, I would love Ken to chime in since we have a browser person here. And anyone else, if there's any Firefox Opera people in the room. I mean, you, please talk about the reality of it, why we do it. I think that's the most fundamental thing. And I'm sure, Scott, you, you, you're, you understand, but this is more for the group, right? Well, um, good question. So we're, we're trying to not blacklist graphics cards. I mean, that, that's what we're trying to, if there happens to be some fairly minor issue that can be worked around in the WebGL implementation because the frame buffer couldn't get set up correctly with the default parameters, we're trying to make our implementation more robust so that it'll work on a broader range of graphics cards. One issue that came up recently is alpha false. Uh, did anybody run into that? Raise your hand if you, if you know what alpha false means. Okay, so there's a couple of people. Um, yeah, so, we, we understand that this is a problem. We want WebGL to be deployed on as many devices as possible. And so we're trying to not use that heavy hammer of blacklisting. Um, yet we do have to work with vendors. For example, there are certain vendors, uh, proprietary drivers on Linux that are really not stable. And we are working actively with those vendors to try to get them to be rock solid so that we can you know, safely turn on uh, those proprietary drivers on, say, other operating systems than the mainstream ones. So that, that's sort of where we're going. But uh, we definitely un understand that adoption will be impacted if we continue to blacklist lots and lots of cards. Yep. Other questions? Do you, um, is there another question here? Like, raise your hand, please. So at the last WebGL camp, um, there was a presentation by the X3 DOM crew. And uh, how do you see a space for X3D uh, in this brave new world? Well, as I mentioned, I'm a little concerned about the lack of there being commonality in file formats. There's some popularity happening in libraries now, like 3GS, and they're starting to evolve JSON representations and all that. But you know, it's a little bit early and fragmented. And, and yet there are these you know, wonderful other formats out here, including X3D, uh, MD2. You, know, you can, you can uh, deliver models in various formats and build readers for them. Um, so I'd like to see the emergence of some uh, X3D readers that people use and, and then reuse content that's already out there. Um, X3 DOM, in my opinion, is also uh, it's getting tangled up with augmented reality and other stuff that's specific to that project. So I, I'd say, I have to say, I'll go on record and on uh, bits on, on video as saying, I am freaked out by the way AR is getting conflated with anything with X3D and especially WebGL. Uh, you know, wonderful areas of research, uh, still very early. And the last thing I'd want to see now is, is that that whole thing gets mixed up in people's minds and that, that somehow people believe that WebGL has to be an AR you know, application platform when there's so many other things you can do with it that have nothing to do with augmented reality. So my, I have a little fear about X3D, X3DOM from the project requirements side of it, but the idea is great. And I'd like to see some you know, simple light X3D readers built into to some libraries um, because I think there's some content out there and people are familiar with it. And, and tools, for example, like you know, ones that I built before that got sort of trapped in, you know, in an IP a uh, hole with companies that bought the technology, but you can actually get a hold of, for example, Vividi Studio and, and output X3D files, but nobody can actually maintain the tool right now because somebody else owns it. So I, I'd certainly like to see that. Very cool. Please give a hand for Tony. I guess I'm done. Okay.